Um, we think this is the 15th or 16th. John's just told me this is his absolute favourite one to do. So I can imagine we are all in for a treat. So um, should we get started, John? Yeah, sure. Sure. OK, so uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to this one. Um, let's say this is one of my favourite ones. It has to be all the medical stuff. Um, and, and basically, you know, it, we've got so much medical stuff in the archives, over 4,000 items that relate to medical treatments and medicinal things. Um, and you'll see some of the ingredients later. So if you think Shakespeare's the eye of newt, etc., cetera, was, was, was strange, then, you know, there is going to be some really weird stuff in here. But we're going to be looking sort of like it's, it's a smorgasbord, really, because there's so much stuff. So we're, we're going to be looking at various cures, treatments and things like that. Um, I'm going to start off just by looking at apothecaries. Um, these are the people who made drugs or medicines um, that physicians basically prescribed, um, and the medicinal grievance could be anything. Those animal parts, you know, they're all used, made into pastes or powders for external or internal use, or for aromatherapy even. Um, many use natural products, especially plant products, so chamomile, fennel, mint, garlic, rose, lavender, um, but there's lots of other nasty things, you know, urine, fecal matter, earwax, human fat and saliva. And there's a great picture at the top there from Rowlandson, The Dance of Death, you know, people waiting for the apothecary and the man glancing behind the curtain there, looking at the skeleton actually mixing up some powder. So, you know, these are the apothecaries, these are the people who made stuff. They usually operated from premises because they had to have space to operate and store their equipment and ingredients. And this is a typical example of what we've seen. This is for an apothecary shop being sold in Tewkesbury. Um, it's around about um, 1780, I think it is. But it's basically a complete shop, you know, fitted up in a handsome manner and labelled according to the new dispensary. It's still mortars and other utensils. You know, and also this this person who was staying in the shop also did surgery and midwifery because he's got a collection of in instruments there, which we'll, we'll look a bit more at later. Um, sometimes you get the apothecary's journals surviving. Um, this one comes from North Leach uh, Jail, and it calls the apothecary Thomas Child, who used to visit the prisoners and treat any ailments. And to be honest, most of these, you, you look through this book, and it's just basically got the lines here, as you can see, you know, visited all the prisoners and found them in good health. That's the usual entry. It looks like he, he visited at least once a week, maybe more often. Um, prescription books. Um, from the early 1800 onwards, apothecaries and their later incarnation of pharmacists, they were regulated. And one outcome of this was they had to record the drugs and medicines they made and sold in prescription books. They also used to have poison books um, if they knew there was a known poison. Um, but this is an example here. They've got an entry for each prescription and the medicine given to the customers. It's usually written in Latin and abbreviations, heavily abbreviated very often. Um, but they're full of the ingredients used in the treatment of ailments, although annoying they don't often give the name of the actual ailment so they've got lots of information about things they were given to people but not what for sadly um, and we often see through these books they've got a fairly good collection this is from Walwyns of, of Tukes of Gloucester and we've got about 30 of these often you'll see this rx symbol and you can see it on the on the on the various entries there and the sort of let's say it's go from the one up from the bottom, you see this little, looks like a number seven, it's actually RX. Uh, and we're pretty sure this means the Latin word for recipe, which means to take. So that's part of the, what they were doing. Um, the other thing with these books is the handwriting in them is usually atrocious. You know, they say vets are failed doctors. Uh, I think pharmacists are failed doctors as well because the handwriting is absolutely awful. Um, so if you want to become a barber surgeon or, or an apothecary back then, you know, um, you usually learn to via apprenticeship, but not always locally. And we've got an example here which shows that James Gardner of Sirencester was apprenticed to Thomas Hinton, who was a citizen and barber surgeon of London. It's a classic sort of apprenticeship. You know, he has like five or six years doing it. He's not allowed to do certain things, fornication and gambling and band, for example. Um, but, you know, in, in being being away from home he actually got to learn a trade he got some he got food and board and everything like that and he would come out at the end of it with a, a reasonable profession that he could do this is another one and it shows that as, as time passed the roles often merged so this is for john hitchman of north leach he was an apprentice to a surgeon and apothecary uh, at fairford so this is where he's now going to be learning surgery and apothecary and how to mix medicines so you know, this is something that happened more and more often as time passed but then it sort of diverged again in more modern times um 
tools of the trade. So if you were going to become a, a surgeon, a bomber surgeon, you needed the equipment. Um, we can get a lot of things here from uh, inventories. And, and this is perhaps one of the best documents we have in the archive, I have to say. It's an inventory of the barber surgeon, John Dighton of Tewkesbury, died in 1649. And in his will, you get this wonderful list, a, a surgery chest with these instruments in it. Um, you know, and you know, there's about three, two pages of this, plus the subsequent pages listing his medical reference books. You know, and this is one, this is wonderful stuff. I mean, I portray a, a barber surgeon and I've based half my sort of kit on what this had. So you get to see the individual instruments, you know, and what they were used for. So you see here a dilator to open the mouth with a screw, a tooth crane's bill, which is forceps basically, uh, another crane's bill cutting instruments draw bore out bullets etc so you know this is a really wonderful document and it, it's it's you know deserves a, almost deserves a talk on its own to be honest um, you had to be licensed before you could practice though and this was usually licensed by the Diocese of Gloucester especially in the early days so this is an example of a license for Nathaniel Dean of Water Under Edge in 1719 it's fairly scribbly like writing so there you go that's what it is translated I Nathaniel Dean the parish of Water Under Edge the Diocese of Gloucester being admitted to practice surgery within the same diocese do subscribe willingly and heartily to the 39 articles of religion agreed upon in convocation in the year of our Lord 1563 and also declare that I will conform to the liturgy of the Church of England as it is now by law established. So had to be licensed by the church before he could do anything at all. Um, you know, which nowadays, you know, obviously it's one gone. You don't need to be do that anything today. But if you were caught, you know, practicing without a license, you were usually brought before the church consistently taught and face fines or excommunication. And this is another one we have again, very scrappy writing in these records, unfortunately. But this is the indictment of Thomas Gale of Chip and Sodbury, who is brought before the court in 1612, December, for practicing physic and surgery without license, being not able to read, and for barbing upon the Sabbath day for and for his negligence in coming to church. And again, this guy in all sorts, he's he's practicing physic, so it's apothecary as well. He practices surgery, he can't read which the thought you know is that going to affect him you know what has he learnt this trade and for barbing which is hair cutting basically on, on the sabbath day and he didn't go to church so you know he's going to get a fairly hefty fine i would think um it's not just the boys the Dawson court book books we have here also hold evidence for the earliest to at least one of the earliest female practitioners in Gloucestershire and it's on 9th of October 1612 while Elizabeth Bull the wife of John Bull was presented to the court for practicing physic although the surgery latter word physic was crossed out surgery added with the phrase being not licensed um <clears throat> you know I haven't got an image of this. We couldn't find it in the book. We think the reference is wrong, but we know it's definitely there, which is a shame. So replace it with this rather nice uh, wise woman cupping a patient. I like this picture very much. If you have a look, she's got a glass cup on the patient's foot, but on the box next to her with the holes in, that's a leech box. So there's going to be leeches in there and she would put them in the cups and put them on the lady's skin to actually start the extraction of the blood. And you also see a nice syringe and her assistant there. And they're quite well assistants wearing this sort of basket hat. I'm not sure um one of the cases in point could you afford to be ill back then i mean before the nhs was formed in 1948 medical treatment was relatively hugely expensive and only the wealthy could really afford it so most people relied on their families um, or the overseers of the poor and hoping that they would pay for treatment from the parish coffers or from any parish charities and this is an example from cam cam parish seems to have retained a lot of its medical stuff uh, and its expenses claimed by a surgeon william fry in 1807 for treating various parish poor you know and we'll look at this one a little bit again later on because it comes up but you know he's actually charging a lot of money for this but the, the overseers are quite happy to pay for it um, again, treatments could be very, very expensive. You know, this is a, a really interesting account from St. Olgate's Parish in Gloucester. And it's a note about basically curing the pauper Jonathan Beard of a confirmed pox. It could be smallpox, could be the French pox, we're not quite sure, it could be just scruffular or something. Um, but this is a really interesting one because they, put, they agreed that the apothecary, John Matthews, was to receive a guinea and a half instantly one half guinea if the patient dies in the operation and if he lives another guinea when the cure is completed so there and you know this is only the bottom half and you can see the, quite what he's operating on we don't know it's an interesting one you don't normally operate for a pox but you know it amounted to about 320 quid today if the patient lived or 215 if he didn't so the surgeon was making sure he was getting some money he was getting paid for this
Um, because of the expense, you'd often find rural parishes would often set up medical clubs, which is like a community saving scheme, allowing people to pay in small sums of money to get medical treatment. This is an example of Kempsford Parish, um, where people are paying in, you know, over the year, maybe a shilling, two shillings. You know, if you're very rich, you might pay in more, but it would sort of guarantee them to get some treatment. Towns often establish more formal schemes uh, run by usually run by subscription, like this is an example for the Winchcombe Independent Medical Club. Um, so again, you're paying in to sort of like, it's like an insurance. In a way, it's pretty much like the national insurance we pay today, but these were local ones rather than a national one. Charitable schemes, you know, usually linked to the church and run by the philanthropic great and the good, are also pretty common. Um, this is the Cheeksbury Dispensary, which is a church-based charity established in 1815. And again, it was a sort of typical, this is an application form for it. Um, and to be eligible, the patient had to be a proper object for the charity. It had to be approved by a previous subscriber, but then they could get advice, medicines, treatment and vaccinations if needed. Um, rules here, you can see the rules there, I didn't think too many to go through, but you, know, you had to return empty medicine bottles, but you also had to make a public show of thanks at your place of worship, so if you didn't go there you weren't going to be included in this scheme. Um, one of the only advantages of being in a prison at the time was you got free medical treatment. Um, and again, this is another one from the North Leach apothecary here. So um, he visited all the prisoners, found John Beard with a complaint in his bowels and William Barford with a swelling and inflammation in his groin and thigh. I gave them medicine for it, found all the others in good health. So again, on his weekly visits, this chap, Thomas Child, would actually look at the patients. If they needed treatment, they would get it. Um, you know, and from the prisoner's point of view, this is great because you're not going to get this sort of treatment outside. Um, however, you know, cures for free, you know, family folk cures and church charms were very, very popular. And most people, this was the way they were treated, especially if they had hand-me-down cures and charms coming down through the family. Um, typical charms aimed at toothaches and thorns. And this is one for a thorn. Again, it's fairly scrappy writing. Here you go. A charm for a thorn. Near Bethlehem, our dear saviour Christ was born. And on his head was crowned with a crown of thorns. And in this please, the thorn I do expel, hoping through Christ it may neither fester age nor swell through Jesus Christ our Lord amen so this was the sort of typical sort of charm you would do if you got there and I'm presuming it's like a black thorn which we can all go can go very nasty it wasn't just black thorns though uh, and also charms usually had to be repeated several times they nearly always had medical uh, religious connotations this is a nice one for Minsterworth a charm for stopping blood which was to be repeated five times and this is how it goes you know a charm for stopping blood i believe jesus christ to be the son of god he was born of the virgin mary and was baptized with john the baptist in the river jordan the water was wide and red he commanded it stood so stand ye blood in the name of father son and the holy ghost three persons on trinity and one god good lord so in this charity for thy servant amen you'd have to do that five times and then you hope that the blood would actually stop flowing um, another one here with open course open fires used for cooking burns and scones were so terribly common and usually resulted in death especially of young children so they got a charm for it and again here you go a charm for a born or a scold mary mild has burned a child and on a spark of fire out fire in frost in the name of the father son and holy ghost amen 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 so you'd be doing this hoping beyond hope that it's actually work the other way you could get was tonics. They were a really popular way to aid health. They nearly always used some sort of free ingredient or a cheap ingredient, and they usually had alcohol and sugar to help with the taste, because some must have tasted pretty terrible. This is a fantastic one. This is for snail water, and it's uh, from 1782, and it's typical. It's a great big list of instructions. It requires half a peck of garden snails. It's about a gallon or nine litres of, of garden snails here. And they're part of the preparation is that they've got to be bruised, i.e. mashed in a mortar, you know? So this is pretty horrific already. Um, but it also includes things like spearmint, ground ivy, hyssop, yellow archangel, comfrey, campfire, which is a type of henna, enigo, indigo, and sugar. So they have lots of things going into under these things. Um, and it's basically a little tonic. So you took four or five spoonfuls every morning before dinner and at night, you know? So it's a little thing to keep you going. 
whether these things are going to be any good, we just don't know. Um, but if you thought that previous one could be improved, you're yeah, actually quite right. And here's another recipe for hot snail water. You just need to add earthworms. OK, so this is one from Mrs. Wilson. You, to as well as your two gallons of snails, it requires the delightful addition of half a pint of earthworms that had to be slit open and actually put in the mix before you could drink it or before you could eat it. Um, luckily, I had also had four quarts of brandy in it. So that's probably going to do you more good than any of the earthworms and the snails. Well, having said that, there's a lot of research going on to earthworms because, because they live underground, which is a really hostile environment with lots of viruses and bacteria. And as far as we can tell, earthworms don't actually get ill. So there's lots of scientific work going on into earthworms at the moment to see if, see if they do work. And um, we'll mention snails later on, what good they could do for you. Um, some of these tonics are really odd. This is one that's given to the uh, slave abolitionist Granville Sharp in 1810 by a client. Uh, it's a tonic for his niece, Mary Baker. Um, and it calls for half a pound of coal, boiled in a cup and a half of milk to half the quantity, strain it off and drink a cup of it night and morning. So you basically you're drinking coal that's been warmed up in milk. Why? It probably produced coal tar in some form, which, you know, we all remember the smell of coal tar, I'm sure. It's got antifungal, anti-inflammatory, anti-itch and anti-parasitic properties. It's still used today, but you don't usually take it internally, um, you know, and this must have tasted absolutely foul, I would think. So we're going to look at some of the illnesses, diseases and cures as, as, as we come to the next st stage of this. I love this picture. So remember one of the medieval manuscripts, it's, it's a monkey looking at the urine of a stork and he's going to be treating it. So he's doing a bit of uroscopy, as we used to call it. So bleeding or bloodletting. Um, it was used to treat almost every disease, either on its own or a combination with other treatments. And it could be done using scalpels, fleams or leeches. Um, leeches were great. They were far less painful, but they didn't take much blood. So you get these fleams, this is the one at the top. These were used on animals and on humans to drain blood off. They thought it was the way to do it. It was looked on as a pick me up and it was deemed a very good way of keeping you sort of hale and hearty. Um, so this ran through society and so bleeding parish poor was very popular because they thought it would keep them healthy and prevent illness and disease. And this is a little entry from the vestry account book of King Stanley of a payment made to a surgeon to bleed the poor people of the parish in 1733. Again, very scrappy, but Leonard Stanley to bleed the poor people in the workhouse and arm size for his pay on the poor rate. It's typical family history, isn't it? Having this person called Leonard Stanley living in King Stanley. You know, that caused a lot of confusion until I realised what it was on about. Um, this is another example. This is a bill from George Rodway, a surgeon to the parish overseers of Upton St. Leonard for bleeding various women of the parish over 13 months in 1826. You know, he actually came back from repeatedly. So Nancy Hamlet, he bled six times, her daughter Sarah twice, Mary Whitcomb three times, Emma Heal twice, and Elizabeth Webb once. So, the, you know, this is an ongoing thing. Quite why he's doing it to these women. Are they the ones who aren't feeling well? We don't, we just don't know, sadly. And interestingly, you know, the cost is a shilling to a sixpence, somewhere around that. So it goes from about £3.40 to £1.70 in modern money. Um, for a pain in the head, many cures existed for headaches from chewing willow bark, which contains salicin, which is a natural aspirin, um, to quite complicated cures that required making. This is one from Frampton 7 from Nathaniel Clutterbuck's Commonplace book. Um, all these ingredients have been used in medicinal cures for centuries, and many still are. Um, so take two spoonfuls of juice of chamomile, two Two spoonfuls of breast milk, two spoonfuls of vinegar, and two spoonfuls of red rose water. Put it all together in a dish upon the fire, grate a nutmeg into it, and then take a piece of red rose cake, the breadth of the forehead, and lay it on the forehead. A lot of this was relied on a basic simple rule. If it smelt nice, it was probably good for you. If it smelt horrible, it probably wasn't. And that's one thing that goes through all these cures they're usually trying to use nice good ingredients that they like because they think they're going to do us good um to cure a toothache well toothache mouth hygiene was very poor in the past although you know people did clean their teeth usually using sort of 
bent twigs at the end, which would act like a little brush. And they'd use lots of mouth rinses. So salt and sage rubbed together and baked together was a classic one. And again, you know, it would have helped a bit. You know, you can pick your teeth with your knife as well. So, you know, people aren't 100% awful mouth hygiene, but it was nowhere near the standards we use today, obviously. Um, when it struck, however, people became desperate. This is where folk magic played a role. We've got this wonderful cure here. It's to cure a toothache. And the person was advised to take a new nail and make the gum bleed with it and then drive it into an oak. This did cure William Neal. So William Neal's son, a very stout gentleman when he was almost mad with pain and had a mind to have pistoled himself. So, I mean, this guy had a really bad toothache. It got to the point where nothing was working. He's actually going to shoot himself till somebody said, hang on a minute, yeah, try this cure, take a nail, make your gum bleed with it and drive it into an oak tree and you'll be fine. And it seems to have worked. Well, you think, why did this work? Most likely, this chap, William Neal, he must have had some sort of abscess under a tooth, I suspect. Really, really painful. But if you take that nail and you're basically going to make the gum bleed, you're bursting the abscess. That's going to relieve the initial pain. And then your mouth saliva is going to wash in and out of that hole. So it might well cure it. So this is probably what happened. So it shows you that in some of these recipes, some of these cures, a little bit of sort of odd, what sounds odd to us today might actually have had an effect. Look at the plague. Um, we all know the most notorious that plague. It's the plague, the Black Death and the Great Plague, but it was actually endemic until the 1700s. And it was rare that there wasn't an outbreak going on somewhere in the county or the country. Um, plague victims were typically isolated, either being locked in their own houses or removed to other places such as pest houses. And this is one from Great Charter in Kent. Real nice example. It's by a Morocco survived. Um, they were typically small buildings, usually with one room with a fire, usually located close to a cemetery or a pond where they could just dump the dead bodies in. And then this is another one from the Welcome Collection. You can see there, a plague, plague pit. Um, in Gloucester, plague victims were confined to a narrow strip of land, the goose ditch in the vineyard. This was by the East Gate <clears throat> and the city built several pest houses there to accommodate them. Um, we know that in 1620 the old buildings, which were possibly medieval ones, were rebuilt with two new, two new rooms for habitation with a chimney in each of them. These were also let out to tenants, although in time of plague the council reserved the right to put any infected person of the plague in there. So presumably, you know, if they came in and said, here's a load of plague people, you're going to leave that house quite quickly, I would think. The writing here is just about readable you can certainly see to put any people uh, of the infected on the plague a little bit of slurp there as Keith Floyd say so where was it well this is a couple of maps from Gloucester the one on the left is from Speed's map of Gloucester and the one on the right is the sort of the new civil war defences one we sort of found um, and we think that in this sort of area here this is the goose ditch down there the goose lane ran down so this is pretty sure where, the, where these pest houses were Lots and lots of cures of plague existed. It's one of these things that almost anything you can make up, it would be worth trying. This one comes from the Standish Manor Court Records back in 1545. You're never going to read that. It's terrible. So this is a copy of it. And again, you can see it's using fairly simple things. Handful of green sage, herb of grace, which is rue, elder leaves, red bramble, mix them through with wine take some ginger to it, add it in. You know, you're supposed to drink one spoonful of the medicine nine days together. And after the ninth one, you'll be safe for 24 days, you know. But look at the disclaimers here. The first one, if by fortune some to be sick of the plague before you've drunk it at all, then take some water of skirtbeck and water of bitten plus fine treacle. Now the fine treacle might be Venice treacle, which we'll look at later. Put them all together and cause the sick to drink of it. You know, OK, that might work, but, you know, we're in Gloucestershire. We might be able to get bitten water, but scurbeck water, that's like miles away. And then there's a second disclaimer. You know, if you're doing this, but you still get a sore appears, probably referring to a bubo, the swelling under the armpits, you take leaves of bramble, leaves of elder, mustard seed, you know, steep them together and make a poultice and lay it on, hopefully draw it out. And again, with that, probably nothing's going to happen, but the mustard seed, if it imparts enough heat, it might help a bubo burst, but it's not going to help the person recover. Um, this is a really interesting thing. It's quite a sad one, really. It's in the North Nibley Burial Register for 1638, um, you know, and it's a little 
piece at the bottom and it reads because it'd be hard to read mind that this year 1638 please god to visit this parish with the plague of which henry matthews john his son mary his daughter and abigail daughter of nicholas mundy whose names are written above were all suspected to die and these parties whose names are underwritten were all certainly known to die of the same. And beneath that, it goes on to two pages. The first ones you can see there, John Cope, his wife, Elizabeth, his two daughters, Joan and Avril, they both died the same day, and his son, Robert. While below that, on the top of the next page, you get Randall Jennings and his four daughters were drifted. All these people were buried in their gardens. Okay, they weren't, nobody was going to risk taking them to the church. Of course, you can have some brave very brave grave diggers to do this but it gives you the idea so you know we don't get many mentions of this but you know it does happen there so you know obviously this plague came along struck at this this parish and, and disappeared it's so terrifying the plague there is it was a threat to spread to parishes that people would often just shut them be shut up in their homes and they would be given food as long as necessary and um, this comes from withington parish in 1665 so before the great plague and it shows money being used to provide food for people who were isolating you know we all know what that's like at the moment but you know this you know at this time is much worse um so you can see they've actually spent paid it several times for and on behalf of persons infected and shut up in the time of the safe contagion it's five pounds it's quite a lot of money for that time um it, we know it would have purchased in modern money about 28 pounds or 13 kilos of wheat which would have gone into them so they could make bread presumably they're pushing wood through the door as well but you're going to stay far away from these people as you possibly could Moving on to this is a really interesting one, the English sweat or the sweating sickness. Mysterious disease present from about 1485 to 1551, after which it more or less vanished. There might have been a couple of outbreaks in the continent later, but that's outside our scope. This is the Buckland Parish Register for July 1551, so it records the death of five villagers, George Holliers, William Parry, Richard Walkman, uh, Robert Hay and William Goddard, um, all in close proximity. Uh, very quickly, these are definitely sweating sickness, and you can see it's written there, Anadomni, 1551, um, was the sweating sickness. Was... It's an odd, odd, really odd one. You get chills, tremors, fever, pain, sweating, very, very quickly, often within an hour of infection. Um, death rate of 30 to 50%, but oddly, it mostly only affected middle-aged, wealthy, upper-class males. Normally, this sort of thing would come along and kill all the old people and all the children, but this one didn't really seem to affect them. It's just these middle people, and, and nobody knew why. We still don't know why, because its cause is still unknown. We think it might have been climate-related, because outbreaks were always in summer, and usually preceded by rainfall and flooding. So this hints at sort of, you know, a mosquito, tick, rodent, or bat-borne virus. There's another option. We'd also, they think it could possibly be an anthrax type of thing, but it doesn't fit. Nothing of this fits all any modern symptoms. The current theory is it is actually a bat-borne hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, it's an unknown type of hantavirus, which are really nasty things, and they still around today, still break out occasionally. Um, but they are currently trying to sort of genetically sequence bodies who have known and died from this, trying to find out, isolate what this is, because you know, we really wouldn't want this coming back. Um, dropsy, this is the name of edema, where you get excess fluid collected in body cavities or tissues of the body, usually from underlying disease of the heart, liver, kidneys, or from malnutrition. Um, and the North Leach Jail Apothecary's Journal has this one case, the pr a prisoner with a tendency to dropsy. So he was given an opening mixture to try and purge him, get rid of the fluid that way. But he was also given a bit of a better diet. So he had half a pound of mutton and two ounces of oatmeal daily, in addition to what is usually ration was. So that might have helped him out. That's a good bit of food he's going to get. You know, it's not got all the vitamins, but it's certainly going to be better than his normal sort of food. They would also, I mean, in this case, they would often purge people and drain the wounds or drain the dropsy, as it were. So this is an example. Interestingly, dropsy patients are always very thirsty and they would keep drinking to alleviate it because they're drinking wine and beer. 
So purging was a fairly common treatment. It was also why, because the church viewed this as a sinful thing. You've obviously been really greedy and gutsy. So, you know, it's a religious thing as well. And we've got this rather interesting purge or dry and diet drink from the Hicks Beach Collection, a fantastic mix of ingredients. Um, most notable perhaps is sarsaparilla, which is the dried root of a vine from Mexico. I'm sure, you know, remember Calamity Dream giving me some sarsaparilla. Um, and again, it was common over here because it was used to make non-alcoholic root beer, which was popular with the Methodists in the temperance movie. But there's lots and lots of ingredients in there. Um, and on the exhibition that we'll be putting up today or tomorrow, there's a bit more explanation about this one. If you decide to be draining, they would use two things. Either they're going to use a trocar, which is the, the pictures of the brain object there. So it's basically a funnel with a needle in it. You punch, push it into the way you're going to drain the fluid, pull out the sort of the handle, allowing the fluid to drain out. Another way they used to do it was actually to take a needle, a needle, big thick needle with string, thread it through the area where you wanted to drain and then pull it out, but leave the string there so the fluid could drain out through the Again, pretty horrific, and it's not the sort of thing we do anymore. Um, a bit about rheumatism or rheumatic disorders, they're often sort of conditions causing chronic intermittent pain affecting the joints or connective tissue. I'm sure we've all those people who've got it. Um, it doesn't specifically Describe any specific illness, but there's like 200 different conditions. So, you know, it's difficult to identify today. It was more or less impossible back then. Um, and this is a nice cure for, for a reasonably more modern one, to be honest. It's, um, it's same from a, a memo book from the standard shopkeeper. Typical range of ingredients for rheumatism. Got palm oil, marshmallow ointment, turpentine, lime oil, spike or lavender oil, spirits of wine, which is medical alcohol at the time, spirits of tar, pine cone water, camphor and olive oil. And luckily it's a, you don't eat it, you drink this, you rub it all over the place. So, you know, some of those things we can see today, you know, they still use, so lavender oil is supposed to be, camphor is supposed to be good for it. And obviously today we've got a lot better, a lot better things. Um, look, quick look at constipation here. Um, it could be treated a number of ways. William Dyer, the prisoner in one of the prisons, North Leach, first received the warm bath, which must have been lovely, you know, a lovely warm bath. But then he was given medicine in the form of opening pills and mixture. So basically, that's laxatives, and he's going to need to go to that toilet quite quickly. Look at the opposite, the bloody flux. Um, this was dysentery, essentially. So it's an infection of the intestines causing diarrhea, containing blood or mucus, usually with fever and abdominal pain. Caused by poor hygiene, it, it was very common. And though most patients eventually recovered, it was often fatal. And of course, King John died of dysentery. Lots of people did. Um, many, many cures existed. And this is a not a typical one, I have to say. This is a remedy for a flux. Now, this is a really, really interesting one. Um, it's very, very difficult to read there. So there you go. Of milk, a pint, and take a very filthy cheese and scrape off the milk. Fresh scrape off the filth, sorry. And boil the milk with the filth you scrape off the cheese. Then you thicken the milk when you boil it, and as you would thicken it with flour or oatmeal. OK, fair enough. You know, is that going to do any good on the face of it? No. But then you think, where did penicillin was first discovered? It's a type of cheese mold. OK, the penicillin we use today isn't quite the same one. It's a different one. But, you know, who's to say, was this some sort of antibiotic that they'd stumbled on? We don't know. Sadly, with all these things, there's never a, oh, yeah, this really worked well. I used it lots of times. You don't see that very often at all. But it's one of the most interesting ones we have, I think. A quick look at the egg. Um, it's an illness marked by attacks of chills, fever and sweating, which occurred at regular intervals, then would sort of dry up and you'd be OK, then they would come back. Um, it's probably malaria. And OK, we might think that's strange, but it was common in the Vale of Gloucester at the time, where mosquitoes abounded in the low-lying waterlogged meadows and marshes along the rivers. Um, it was also, for a lot of it, the climate was a bit warmer then as well. You know, so this is something we maybe have to think about in the future. Are we going to get mosquitoes carrying plague, playing malaria coming back? Um, Lots of cures for it. This is a cure from the Hitchbeach family of Constant Aldwin, and it's a fairly simple remedy from my brother Grindley. Um, you know, it takes half a pint of spring water, that's clear, pure water, obviously, a quarter of a pint of brandy, there's your booze, quarter of an ounce of bark, 
probably from the willow tree, so it's probably got the salicin acid, the uh, aspirin in it, which might have helped calm it all down and everything. Mix it all well together, take one half at night and the other in the morning, you know. So, you know, it's, it's a fairly common cure. They're often like this. There's a really good folk cure for this, and you had to get yourself a live eel, put it in a cloth bag and tie it around your neck and leave it there. For how long, I don't know. Nobody stated that, but that was, again, another way that thought you could cure the egg. Um, and we've got another one here, a little bit more simple. This comes from Thomas Cothra of Longford, that's like Gloucester, dates 1751. Um, and it's similar to the first one, bark, wine, this has got a bit of lemon, but this has got the Venus treacle in it. And then remember I said earlier on, we had a treacle. Um, Venus treacle was also known as theriac. And it was a medical concoction widely used as far as Persia, China, and India. It had lots of various things in it. It was known to always believe to extract venom, basically. So this is, this is why it was in that other cure for plague. And this one, again, is they're trying to extract something from it. It was considered a panacea, a cure-all. Um, the basic formula had vipers flesh, so adder flesh, opium, honey, wine, cinnamon, but there are more than 70 other ingredients in it. There are loads of different things, and it must have been a real concoction. Um, but again, very common, used in lots of recipes over here for cures. Um, some cures for egg were more complicated. This is the same one, the Hicks Beach one. So did the first one work or not? We don't know. But this involves a two-part treatment regime, an electrine infusion. So the main electrine used cortex, which is probably cortex philandry, a bark of philodendron tree. It's almost like right. Um, but it uses roses, poppers, and nutmeg. While the infusion needed century, whorehound, camomile, gentian, coriander, and spring water. Again, so these are all fairly common little ingredients you're using. And after each dose of the electric, you have to have a draft of the infusion. So again, it's a two-part thing. Would it have worked? Probably not. There's not a lot in there that even hints that it would work. Quick at smallpox, um, we know it's a highly infectious disease, death rate of about 30%, painful and disfiguring, usually even survivors with scars and often blind. You often see marked by the pox in reports. And this is a little list of infected persons, <coughs> infected persons in Tetbury in 1746. Look at the number of children there. There's so many children. Very scary. From 1740, sun protection was offered by variolation, which is where scabs or fluid from an infected person were inserted under the skin of somebody being inoculated, hoping that they would catch a mild form of the disease and become immune. But it was very, very risky. And most people actually went on to develop the full-blown illness. Despite that, many parishes tried to inoculate patients using variation. Here's one of the pains that we have where they've, in 1785, where they've decided it's so rife they need to inoculate people. Of course, luckily, 1796, Dr. Jenner discovered that you can make people immune to it by inoculating them with material from a cowpox lesion. So the two diseases are very similar. And Jenner noticed that milkmaids didn't get smallpox. So he thought this, so he basically found one who had cowpox and started passing it to other people. He called the material a vaccine from vaca, the Latin for cow. It was much, much safer, didn't involve the risk of small trans transmission. Um, in 1840, the government banned variolation and made vaccination free of charge, and they made it compulsory in 1853. But obviously, not everybody liked it. Even at that early date, there were still anti-vaxxers who argued it was dangerous and against free will. But yeah, but you're going to live. And this is a fantastic cartoon from the time where you can see the patients queuing up for Dr. Jenner. Dr. Jenner is the chap in the brown jacket. The patient first gets an opening mixture, and then Dr. Jenner's inserting the um, a, <laughs> vaccinating them and then people look at the cow appendages sprouting out on various people so this is one of those great great Rollinson cartoons but luckily they but notice at the back of the top there is a picture of Blossom the cow in the picture there Gloucester was a notorious stronghold for anti-vactors crazily supported by the citizen newspaper and it made it really popular among the working classes even though of course it was free as a result, there were several outbreaks of smallpox in the city in 1858, 69 deaths, 1873 to 5, 151 deaths. The biggest one came out a little bit later. Um, here's a couple of 
1896, a major outbreak arose in the poor schools and the poor districts. Again, this was the citizens saying, oh, you don't need it, you don't need to do this stuff and everything. It spread really rapidly. Within a month, the whole city was in quarantine. And we've got a couple of pictures coming up now. Um, you know, have a look at them, but don't look too long if you don't want to. This is what it does, okay? This is Ethel Cromwell, bless her heart, 14 in this epidemic with the smallpox. The good news about this one is she survived it, okay? She, so she survived it. But in the end, the city authority said, no, compulsory vaccination now. It took six months for this outbreak to end. Nearly 2,000 people had been affected, 700 of them children, nearly 500 had died, 280. You know, it's just so, it's there, use it. But crazy, it was the last outbreak in Bruce City, but beyond belief, the anti-vaxxers did well in the subsequent city elections. They voted people in who were against it. Just, you know, and what with COVID now, it's a really good parallel to it. A very, very quick look at the great pox, aka the French disease, which occurs to syphilis, um, which until the advent of antibiotics was incurable, it's a horrible disease. Lots of therapies, including cauterization and ointments, usually with mercury and arsenic, really killing things. Um, you know, and we've got this lovely one in, in March, date 159, 1595 it is. The church consistory tour heard a morality case involved a rather wayward vicar, Sir Richard Ree of Badgeworth, who had engaged several surgeons trying cure him of the pox um he was a he must have been a bit of a guru he ran lots of people engaged four or five surgeons in a year to try and cure him and again this is one of the ones where we don't know what happened next sadly um, um it's a type of tuberculosis infection the length known to the neck um caused by inhaling the genus of the mycobacterium so it couldn't cause tb lung tb or it can cause a neck tb um it was known as the king's evil and it's thought that the touch of a royal person could cure the disease. And this lasted until the, the late 1700s, really. Um, and it was introduced by Edith Confessor, you know, 1042. So it's been around a long time and didn't stop until Queen Anne, when she died in 1714. She was the last person, last royal person to do it. Um, after royal touch, the patient would get a gold coin on a ribbon that was supposed to be hung around the neck to, to sort of to ward off the disease. But in reality, most of those would have been sold and you'd get a real good quality food, which would have much more beneficial effect on their health. Um, but we've got this nice little example from 1633, Thornbury Parish paying five shillings to Margaret Scott to go to Bath to have a royal touch from Charles I. It's going to get very scrappy, but it reads, gave to Margaret Scott to go to Bath to the king to have her daughter cured of the evil. So again, why this idea of the royal touch came up, we just don't know. Um, infallible cure for the bite of a mad dog? Um, rabies terrified people, still does. Um, but as always, the number of people who died from it was quite low. So in the year 1760, when the year in which the madness raged amongst dogs in London, only two people died after being bit by mad dogs. But these cures, cures for the bites were commonplace and widely circulated. The top cure here, an infallible cure for the bite of a mad dog brought from Tonquin by Sir George, um, can't see the bat name, George Cobb, um, from Vietnam, uses mercury sulfides basically, musk, spirits, you've got a whole run of arak, rum and brandy. Um, the bottom cure simply uses rue, venice treacle, which is the theriac, garlic and ale. Um, the last one could also be given to dogs and animals and it was a, a, a sad thing that most dogs back then, if they were thought to be infected with rabies, they were hanged, they weren't shot. They were hanged, which is really scary. So in, in 1760, something like 5,000 dogs were hanged in London because they thought they had, had rabies. A little bit of a cough. And on that note, I'll have a quick slurp. So again, you get hundreds and hundreds of cough cures. This one, again, from the Blathwaite family archive, it is typical. They essentially need something soothing, something sweet and something alcoholic. So this one, beat the yolk of an egg, mix it with one tablespoonful of honey, half of sweet oil, one of rum, pour a quarter of a pint of boiling water on it, stirring it, and then take a small glassful. It's supposed to help and make your sort of cough go away and your throat nice. Again, throat sweets often came into this sort of category as well. Um, fits and convulsions. This is an interesting one. 
This is more of a folk remedy than a medicinal treatment, probably an attempt to treat epilepsy, which is usually, you know, occasionally had surgical intervention in the form of trepanning, and we'll see an example of that a bit later. Um, but this was for fits, take stalks of mistletoe that grows on an oak. That's really, really rare. Mistletoe doesn't like oak, so, you know, this would have been really hard to find. But in this one, you just take this mistletoe, thread it, and wear it around as a necklace, and it's supposed to sort you out. Would it? No, not at all. Um, gout, uh, inflammatory arthritis, basically, caused by recurrent attacks of swollen and painful joint, comes from the Latin gutter, meaning a drop, and it's derived from the idea of humorism. Um, we haven't got time to look at all the humorism, but the idea that this, the blood would drop material in and around the joints, make them tough to move. Um, a strong association with older wealthy males with a history of excessive indulgence in sex, alcohol, sugar sweetened beverages, meat, especially offal, and seafood. And again, Gilroy has this fantastic cartoon of what gout felt like to the sufferer. And I quite like the, the claws of this little beastie are actually hooks that have gone through the skin. Um, but again, it's one of these that didn't know what caused it. That wasn't discovered till 1848. It's actually high levels of uric acid in the blood that crystallize. Um, so it was the subject of hundreds of different cures. This is one example we've got from the incumbent of Tetbury, uh, John Wright, uh, John White, sorry, he's, you know, he's probably about 1650, this is, but look at the details on that. It's a lot you had to do, but it only has three ingredients. Hiera picra, which is wholly bitter, which is a mix of purgative, aloes and canela bark, which is a Caribbean tree. So you're getting this stuff from all over the place. You make this into a powder, mix it with honey, cochineal, and a pint of best old port. You know, the instructions then for taking it are very complex. I've read through this. You start with a quarter of a pint once a day, and you continue until you're taking the whole pint. You know, just depending on the effects, you might have to add fast with it or take it warm or add more wine to it. You know, would it have done any good? Absolutely not. And the, the port and, and the honey and everything would have probably made it even worse, to be honest. Um, this is a more lively gout cure, I have to say, again from the Blathwaite family, bless them. It's typical of the time, purgative basically, using exotic ingredients. So Turkish hemidactyl, which is snakes and iris, jalap, which is a, a distilled concoction of a wine, cenobines, tartar, vitriol, diagridium, which is another amazing sort of mix of, sort of a concoction, comes from the yeast, cloves and mercury chloride. But the most interesting one on this, and you see it in that first three letters in there, raspings from a human skull unburied. You know, this hints again a magic use. Um, Amazing, the use of human body parts in medicines was quite rare. It wasn't very common, has to be said, but this raspings of the human skull and bear is really interesting. But also you had to take this, and you can see it on the uh, one of the fifth line down, about the full of the moon. Now this might actually link it to astrology, um, which were rules employed in humor theory, but from the late medieval period. So again, a really interesting hangover of something that might have worked. Uh, some looking at medical procedures, amputation, everybody's favourite, especially if you do this with kids, they love it. Um, you know, Robert Liston, the surgeon, once amputated a leg in two and a half minutes, it's still a world record. A major step was when he actually decided that actually if you pulled some of the blood vessels out and clamped them, people didn't bleed as much, it gave you more time. Um, various ways of doing it, they used the old pirate straight through, but then they discovered that if you left flaps of skin there, you could sew these up and it helped the cure in. Um, don't have much on it in the archives, but this is an interesting letter from a, a Anne Leonard requesting payment. She'd been asked to treat a woman who'd suffered a leg injury, and Anne noted that the, it was infected and it was perished, basically. So she's actually successfully amputated the leg and made repeated vision, visits to the medicines to treat this patient, who seemingly recovered quite well. I, we, we think Anne probably was more of a wise one rather than a surgeon, but written evidence of female surgeons is really rare. So this is quite an important document. You can see it halfway down, but at that time it was perished. I was forced to cut off the flesh. I began this cure in September. So, you know, she's again basically asking for money, about three guineas, about 370 quid today. So, you know, she's not done this for nothing. She needs, needs money for this. Um, 
I mentioned earlier, it's used to treat skull fractures and relieve pressure from internal bleeding or subdural hematomas, as they call it these days, um, usually sustained after blunt force trauma to the head. Usually you had a scission in the skull, the skull's exposed, and yet you can saw or you can you know, have a circular saw, a brace bit basically, to try and get in there to relieve the pressure in there. Um, we've got one trepanning item, 1794, CAM overseers paid uh, Henry Sanagar for treating. He was visiting the, sorry, Henry Sanagar was the patient for William Fry, a surgeon. We looked at this earlier, this little one. Um, he had several goes at this patient, but trepanned him on 8th of January, 1794. And it reads, to a journey this day and performing the operation of trepanning him with dressings and external applications for the cure, five pounds and ten pence. Not too bad, a lot cheaper than today. Usually people who tr trepan very, very poor, you know, usually dying within, you know, three or four weeks, maybe months. This chap, uh, Henry, was quite lucky. He actually lived the whole year. He didn't die until January 1796. And that's the entry in, in the burial records there. You can see him, see him there on the uh, fourth one down. So again, you know, this must have been reasonably successful. Of course, we don't know. You know, quite how bad it was, or did, did Henry survive, or was he active after this, or was he just in a coma or something? Midwifery, um, most births were attended by female relatives of the mother or local wise women, but if a surgeon, if they thought it was going wrong, they would often call a surgeon in. And again, we got another bill from Cam here. Uh, this surgeon, A. Warner, attended four such birthing instruments in the year. So to Daniel called his wife with twins, Edward hid his wife in difficult labor, Mary Cole in the use of a catheter previous to labor, medicines and attendance, and attendance to a difficult labor, brackets Thayer's wife. So again, the males, they muscled in because of the money basically. And it wasn't until much, much later that, you know, males were actually trained properly. I mean, you know, just not, you're not daft, you want somebody who knows what they're doing down there, not anybody. Um, get these things, these weekly balls of mortality, bills of mortality in the big newspapers. And they're really interesting to see, you know, what you know, the chosen range of what people died from and, and what they were suffering. And you can see this in here, you know, some of the ones we know, some of the ones are basically other names for things. Um, you know, so we've got gout in there. She died of gout. I mean, it's terrible. Probably was something else, but you know, these consumption, you know, colic, chin cough. You know, child bed dropsy, the evil. So it's you know again a TB, twisting of the guts, water in the head, worms. You know, we 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 don't you don't often see these things here, but these are often in the newspaper, especially in the Times, that sort of thing, London ones. So they're well worth a look if you're interested. And finally, just a few other slides. We got with some of these recipes. We don't know what they're always for. This is a lovely one. Comes from the Blathwaite family. Take three sheep's trotters and boil them in a quart of river water. If not to be got, any soft water will do. Well, that's not happening in the Cotswolds, is it? You know, make it a pint, wash your face in it two or three times a day. It's probably a beauty treatment for one of the Blathwaite ladies, we think. And I mentioned it all about snails. Um, today, snail slime is still used in lots and lots of facial complexes. So one of these posh things you see on the telly, nine times out of 10, they've got snail slime in them, believe it or not. And the snails are sort of milked rather than killed. Um, you can't win them all. This is a bill that Joseph Mason produced, the bill for the Hawkesbury Overseers. Very, very detailed. Um, it relates to a patient he treated who then died. <laughs> um, and he's at pains to point out that it was nothing to do with his treatment, but was due to other distempers. Um, <laughs> but to make up for it, he actually paid for a coffin, got the shroud, got the grave dug and brought bread, cheese and butter plus drink for the wake afterwards. Our very last, last slide. Um, a very uh, unusual way to cure a nosebleed. This comes from the Clifford family at Frampton. Um, to stop bleeding of the nose. If, when all other means is pig's dung, bloodstone, cinnamon paper fail, a quantity of crab vinegar in two red clothes, and dip them in, or if you think good, boil them, and so apply them to his neck and to his privy members. This was proved by good wife Lear upon Henry Lear of Gloucester, her son. Okay, I'm sure we all know what a privy member is, so we won't go into it anymore. Um, so that's the end of the talk. Sorry it's been so long. I hope you really enjoyed it, though. Our next talk next month, 24th of August, um, Secrets Revealed, How Does Your Garden Grow? So it's all about gardening and farming and, and plants and things like that. But I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, thanks a lot.
Thank you very much, John. That was brilliant as always. Um, very informative and very entertaining. Um, I've, I've learned a lot. But just to remind people that there will be an exhibition going up today or tomorrow. So a lot of what you've what I've talked about will be on there. Not all of it because we've limited to a certain number of slides on the exhibition. But uh, you know, so there's some little bit more background on some of them as well. So like the rabies one, for example, is a lot more about that. So. <laughs> So uh, if that's it, then, shall we um, say goodbye? See you next time, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. See you next time.